Columbia University, uh, and uh, soon will finish his uh, uh, doctorate uh, on the, uh, uh, I would say, the political economy uh, of Iraq. Uh, is that fair to say? Uh, or the politics, federalism and the economy in Iraq. I don't know if that's political economy or not exactly, uh, at the University of Exeter. Um, I'm delighted uh, to uh, ask you to welcome my dear friend, Joey Chalke. And please turn your cell phones at least to silence. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Taravadi. It's always uh, great uh, uh, to meet you. And, and uh, thank you very much uh, to um, Indiana University for hosting me and welcoming me to this uh, great campus and uh, um, uh, offering me the opportunity to speak. Uh, uh, first, I would like to mention that the uh, first time I've met uh, uh, Professor Stavadi, or I've known him as uh, when he was ambassador to the uh, uh, United Nations. And uh, as an Iraqis or Iraqi by origin, but <coughs> we've also known him as a fine uh, diplomat. Uh, then as a professor, uh, what's something, that, but the most interesting thing that we've discovered over the past, uh, that I've discovered personally over the past two, three days, is that he's ambassador to, uh, he's, a, he's a fine ambassador for Indiana uh, to the rest of the United States. I was having some dinners in, in New York and, and, and DC, and every time uh, people ask me, uh, so you go to Indiana, uh, let me guess, uh, to meet uh, Faisal. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he must have done a, a great job to promote uh, this great university. Uh, yes, we do, uh, Professor Estrovali, we do we, uh, to talk a lot about politics, uh, though most of the time we use each other as sounding boards uh, to examine uh, the various thoughts and the diversity of opinions. Um, well, back to the topic on Iraq. Uh, a country that hijacked the headline for the past 13 years. Um, it, is a, it is very important that we highlight the various issues uh, to understand the country and the challenges that are facing this country and the challenges that this country posed on other neighboring countries and eventually on the rest of the world when it comes to politics and security we need, we need to understand the various uh, factors that are influencing the, the dynamics that shape politics, whether it's in Iraq or the Middle East in general. The 2003 regime change, of which many may envisage this as an end of an era that marked the end of Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party, uh, although may prove to be uh, uh, one important fact, but the other issues that I would like to highlight is the major change and shift that this country had to witness, whether it's kind of like at a, a social level, institutional, politics, um, uh, and so on. The shift of moving from a central state to federal state, the shift of moving from an absolute dictatorship to an anarchy that trying to, uh, to, well, to a democracy that's trying to find its way out of an anarchy. Um, a, a, the shift of um, a state-owned institution from an economic perspective and state control uh, economy to a market economy. All these uh, changes have um, uh, took uh, Iraqis um, by surprise. Um, people of Iraq, until this very moment, struggling to understand the difference um, or uh, the characteristic of decentralization or federalism uh, in general. They still uh, are still struggling uh, to understand um, uh, what does it mean market economy. Uh, and also an absolute confusion when it comes to defining Democracy as life. What is? Where, where, where shall we put the lines in terms of like freedom and so on, and expressing uh, um, our opinions and 
as well as uh, observing the limits that uh, protect other people's uh, um, and, and other entities' um, uh, status. So, <clears throat> so all these kind of like terminologies uh, confused Iraqis in general uh, for the past 13 years, and it's for a very simple reason. Pre the regime change of 2003, uh, the nation uh, had to experience a, uh, a complete isolation of at least 35 years uh, since the rule of the Ba'ath Party in 1968. And, um, and it became very much a, I mean, Iraq's internal affair became very much of a, a, a black box that it was very much challenging for the outside world to penetrate and to learn more about it. Uh, Iraq had to go through, Iraqis in general, uh, had to experience a number of um, um, lethal episodes, whether well, let it be the, the, the ones that, that everyone knows about, which is the Iraq-Iran war, or the uh, invasion of Kuwait uh, uh, by Saddam Hussein, or um, the even like, kind of like the chemical attack on Halabcha that uh, basically took the life of at least 5,000 uh, Iraqi Kurds. But nobody talks about, for example, the, um, the killing fields that took place immediately after the uh, uprising of 1991. People heard about the uprising, but don't know anything about the numbers. You probably heard about the, um, uh, the mass graves, um, at least five to 600 registered mass graves by the United Nations. One of them of Al-Mahawil, just in the, in the province of Babylon, that uh, for once held the, basically was the graveyard of at least 30,000 uh, Iraqi men and women and children all buried alive in, uh, in, during two weeks. The, the, <coughs> the, the, the uprising that uh, led to the, to, the, to the execution of, of at least I mean, if you take like low case uh, um, figures uh, and very conservative figures, uh, 50,000 and to higher figures, 200,000 in three months. It is very difficult to imagine these numbers. Uh, and that all these happens, all these atrocities took place yet not being reported. Uh, <coughs> We used to have, like the world, we used to have like media apparatus and things worldwide, but nobody talked about it. Yes, we don't have the, we never had the, uh, the luxuries of the social media or the internet at that time, but still, the fact that all these uh, atrocities took place in a few weeks and months, yet not been reported or at least given uh, justice in terms of like uh, the highlight to to at least have, understand what happened in Iraq. It, it tells a lot about the position of the various uh, superpowers, <coughs> countries basically, uh, that um, turned a blind eye on what Saddam uh, did to the Iraqi people. Then followed by the 12 harsh sanction years that uh, really uh, change the behavior and influence the behavior of the Iraqi people uh, uh, during the 90s. Uh, it, people like, for example, the lecturers, um, um, doctors, um, they uh, struggle to find basically uh, jobs for as much as three dollars a month. Uh, yet they were not uh, had no option. Uh, but to work as a slave laborer, because if they, if they leave the, the jobs, they, then they will be kind of like persecuted by the Ba'ath Party at that time. So you see like a, a lecturer or a doctor uh, serving at daytime uh, for three dollars a month, which it doesn't make any sense. And <clears throat> during the evening, they are taxi drivers or doing anything. And this era introduced uh, uh, an unfortunate um, environment which encouraged the corruption. It was, you've probably heard about the corruption in Iraq that happens, uh, happens these, day, uh, these years. Uh, they have roots. During the 90s, Saddam 
came on TV in the mid-90s, and he asked the Iraqi people to cooperate with the uh, civil servants and to be more generous to ha have them process their applications. For they, so the practice of corruption became very much legitimized and uh, uh, legalized by the state. Uh, and when the regime change took place in 2003, the correction of salaries took place in 2004, uh, the, uh, the, the casual uh, civil servant uh, employee always looked at the salary as a kind of like a given. It's not like for something that they have to uh, um, um, rely on. Uh, basically, what really matters is the supplement of like the extras that they get from these jobs. So it became a culture. So even if like when changing the salaries of those of like thrived on three dollars, four dollars a month uh, to four hundred dollars to thousand dollars, the salary doesn't matter. It, it's irrelevant. They still ask for. It's become part of the culture. They still ask for basically uh, what is called in Arabic tasir uh, amr facilitation. Uh, an, uh, a nice word of uh, corruption, uh, um, and uh, and this becomes very much kind of like this epidemic became very much endemic in, in the Iraqi society and the practice. The the unfortunate um, um, things that really um, hit uh, all Iraqis is that this corruption that although it continued, it coincided with the rise of oil prices uh, during the 2004 upward. So oil prices started to increase uh, dramatically and because of the uh, uh, new administrations that in place that are still struggling to define or understand new politics post regime change, uh, they followed the, high, the, 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 the increase of oil prices. So, so uh, national budget of which later on became federal budget after the referendum on the constitution in December 2005, um, they started to basically increase the, uh, the, the level of budgets um, and, and set it based on the, how much oil, uh, oil revenues that the country earns. Um, and because Iraq thrived on single source of income, um, Iraq became very much, and Iraqis in general became very much under the mercy of oil prices and oil revenues. This helped the subsequent administration to survive for 10 years of high oil price here. So I'm jumping the topics, I'm not giving you like the ABCs of Iraq and things, so I assume that you know like the region and you've heard enough about Iraq and things. So I'm giving you just a few points highlighting some of the issues that influence the politics, economy, and social factors that, uh, the, the social issues that uh, uh, reshaped Iraq. The <clears throat> so like for example in 2005, uh, the first budget after the correction and the, the adjustment of oil prices, uh, sorry, the adjustment of salaries took place. Um, the first budget was in 2005, uh, registering 19.5 billion US dollars. Um, and this, um, and if, you, if we took, for example, 2013 as a reference here and uh, uh, examined to 2005, we see the budget increase to one point, uh, so 120 billion US dollars. Now, that based on the level of revenues of every single uh, dollar that Iraq earned. The structure of the budget in 2005 was 70% um, spending budget and 30% uh, supposed to be allocated for uh, investment. However, that budget always experienced 20% deficit. It was manageable in 2005, 
we can understand that. 20% is, 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 can be handled. We have the IMF, the World Bank, and other institutions could have helped in lending 3.54 billion US dollars. But when you have a budget of 120 and you have the total deficit 20%, which is much larger than the total budget of 2005, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, that 30% investment allocation, it never existed in the first place because um, um, that budget deficit always was financed from uh, whatever uh, reallocation of cash from various categories to avoid further borrowing from banks. So we did not witness, in Iraq, we did not witness a proper uh, investment projects that, could be, that reflects the increase of high oil prices that Iraq enjoyed over the past few years. Um, and uh, uh, it never, um, Iraq never invested enough, or the administration, should I say, never worked enough in uh, helping diversifying the economy to escape the curse of uh, high oil prices. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the dependency on oil. Uh, revenues. The problem is uh, that uh, we faced uh, over the past, the, when it comes to the economy, uh, that none of the administrators, whether it comes up like from the highest, from the PM level, to uh, the head of the energy portfolios, to the various cabinet members, have ever thought of really thinking of say, investing or building uh, proper state, viable and sustainable uh, state. Uh, they always talked about oil prices, assuming that those, that oil prices um, will continue and sustain for uh, forever, which was something uh, foolish to think of because the high oil prices was very much as, uh, an anomaly uh, that is, uh, uh, I don't know, that's a, for a different talk, but it's basically, um, uh, it was not sustainable and it was just, just for a very limited period. Now, the issue uh, uh, that really um, led to crippling uh, the economy is that the various administrations increased the, the basically the, he uh, the headcount, the employment on public sector. So from two million people on the payrolls in 2005, we ended up having six and a half or more million people on the payroll in 2014. Now with oil prices down, you need to find salaries for us. Hmm. Checkmate. Hmm. So this is this is this is the issue. Now we have like people talking about jobs and governments because Middle East in general, Iraq is in specific. They look into like public sector jobs as kind of like a national right. I have to have a job in government. They, they <coughs> think that it has to be like a policy insurance that they should enjoy and with uh, enough income to help them uh, basically um, handle their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, affairs. It's not the case anymore with oil prices going back down to $30, taking into consideration the various discount rates because the market is glut glutted. So we're talking about $25 if we're lucky selling our oil. And Iraq production, with all the increase of production that they made after the signing the licensing rounds, um, Iraq could hardly earn 32 billion US dollars. This is including the revenues from the Kurdistan oil fields and the southern oil fields. Now, 32 billion dollars can hardly meet the targets of just paying the salaries, which is about, if we include Kurdistan, we're talking about a minimum of 50 billion US dollars. We're not counting here the maintenance costs for the various institutions, the various um, entities, basically the, the state, and of course uh, the, uh, the, the state runs, and of course the, 
the cost of war on ISIS, which cost in Iraq around 25% of its GDP. So over the past um, two years, I think, we, Iraq enjoyed around 78 billion US dollars worth of um, uh, foreign currency reserves from Central Bank that helped as a, uh, to act as a uh, fiscal buffer. Uh, but because of the decline of oil prices and the need for financing and no other means that um, became available basically to help Iraq in terms of financing its, uh, its deficit, the government um, had to withdraw cash from its uh, central bank. And now, the, um, the fiscal, uh, basically the, the, the currency reserves uh, has climbed to down to 30, uh, 43 uh, billion US dollars. And if we continue on that way, we could see this fiscal buffer disappearing over the next 12 to 15 months. Which means eventually uh, having Iraq in a, in a position that is financially uh, incapable of um, doing anything. Now, there are, there are full, you know, basically issues that need to be handled and need to be kind of like corrected um, um, at an administrative level to come uh, basically to overcome this uh, uh, dilemma. Uh, it's not. It's not an impossible to implement kind of like reform at this late stage. Um, at the end of the day, um, Iraq as a country and as a nation survived um, quite difficult, uh, n nearly like a century, 95 years since its first inception on the, on the map in 1921 or since its recognition as a state in 1931-32. It survived at least nine military coup d'etats. It survived various um, uprisings and revolutions, uh, change of uh, system from monarchy to uh, republic, um, a complete a radical regime change in from um, an absolute tyranny, uh, tyranny to uh, an anarchic democracy in 2003, so uh, still, the country's still on the map, the people are still surviving, and they survived all these difficult episodes, including the very harsh years of the uh, sanctions. <clears throat> However, there are two things that need to be done in terms of trying to overcome this crisis. One, and this is the, uh, on the responsibility of the administration and the Iraq, the, basically the government in Iraq, as well as the Iraqi people themselves, and I'll come to the, uh, to basically outline them. And the other one is, is, is a responsibility uh, that uh, uh, I would see as the responsibility of the international community. The war on Daesh or ISIS, although it kind of like emerged and surfaced from the territories of North, uh, from northwest part of Iraq and, and, and northeast part of Syria. It is no more a Iraqi-Syrian problem. This is an issue that the whole of the international community should take responsibility in resolving it. When you have millions of people fleeing their countries, crossing borders to Europe, reaching out to Canada, and possibly the United States, and so on, uh, because of like various policies being devised and adopted in the Middle East, influenced by the inter international powers, these things need to be taken into consideration. It's not a kind of like Iraqis, this is your problem. You have to deal with it. And you have to spend from your, basically, revenues to, to buy weapons. I think it's quite unethical for any Western government would send a bill to the Iraqi government to say, could you please pay us the bill for the, for the jets, for the bullets, for the things. Because they're, 
because yeah, the Iraqi people are fighting a, a war on behalf of the international community. Radicalism, although the dynamic emerged in Iraq, but radicalism has roots. And we're talking about a very kind of like radical sects that emerged in countries specifically founded in, in countries such as Saudi Arabia, such as other GCC members, of which they are strong allies of the United States and the and the basically uh, the European Union. And measures need to be taken into kind of like uh, handling radicalism because there's one thing is that killing a few ISIS and controlling the territory, that's one thing. And um, reforming and, and putting like social reforms and uh, developing um, uh, a friendly environment is something else. Maintaining that to hope, basically to help the nation to survive. We probably heard about um, how I mean, we've seen on the news of like how much ISIS make of oil, for example, uh, revenues to finance its affairs and from antiquities and so on. You will be very shocked to realize that all these headlines are misleading and it's a complete cover up for the actual financiers of, of this war, proxy war, on the when it comes to ISIS. And I did a complete investigation on this. And the amount of oil, and whether it's in terms of like the, the, the volumes, the, uh, the revenues, the quality of that oil, could hardly contribute to 10% to meet local demand, let alone making millions of dollars and financing a complex military campaign that occupies one third of two countries and outmaneuver an international coalition of which the United States is member. You need billions of dollars to do this. You need sophisticated intelligence. You need state actors. And this is not I'm not here kind of like to give you a kind of like to dive into the detail, but just to give you an idea what, how sophisticated this situation <coughs> that we have. So for a, 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 a transnational terrorist group like ISIS to control such territory and, and, and <coughs> defeat regular armies and the various basically the faction of the, 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 the Iraqi units, whether it's kind of Iraqi army units, whether it's kind of like from the special forces of Peshmerga, or you need special capabilities. And it's not something that evolved over the past uh, few years. It has roots, and, and there's an ideology behind it, and there are great um, major supporters behind it. So when it comes to resolving the military issue, I don't think the Iraqi people or the Iraqi government should be responsible in handling the situation alone. Uh, and I think it is absolutely unethical uh, to assume that the Iraqi people or the Iraqi government should pay for every single bullet imports, basically, to fight uh, a transnational terrorist groups that uh, already waged a war against humanity, not only Americans. Now, back to the reforms of how can Iraqis in general kind of like overcome the issues when it comes to the administration, the uh, economy, and so on. I look at the low oil price scenario, although it was a blessing that turned to a curse by making a nation and administrations more kind of like lazy and relying on single source of income, let's hire people and pay them and, and forget about any possible scenario that could turn against uh, uh, us if oil prices go down. I think that blessing, although it's now turned into um, the, low, the, the low oil prices is very much seen as an economic curse, but it's in a blessing in a way. 
because it will force the Iraqi people to really identify and uh, explore uh, opportunities and uh, to develop real economy because the oil is may not be the most important uh, single source of income. Maybe it's important now, but may, may not be uh, uh, so important in 20 years, 30 years. Market fundamentals uh, have witnessed significant change over the past few years. In the past, we've seen like uh, traditional oil and gas uh, or conventional oil and gas contributing to the uh, to the energy supply as a as a as a, a primary fuel. Then afterward, we've seen the unconventional sources contributing to the energy mix. Renewables now in, uh, share within the energy mix is increasing. Um, even um, the open cartel that used to control uh, two thirds of the uh, the oil supplies in the world 40 years ago now can hardly control 33 percent, and this share could decline significantly to 20 percent over the next 15 years or so. So I'm not saying that the importance on oil will disappear. No, it will continue to, con to play a, a, an important role, but it's, it, it, we are facing a, or coming into an era where oil is not necessarily the most important, it may not be the most important uh, player when it comes to uh, um, energy supply uh, and uh, fuel, to fuel economies. Um, so this is um, so basically um, rentier economies that thrived on that single source of income should really explore and identify uh, uh, other ways because if not doing, if, if not building, uh, if those countries fail to build any kind of viable economies, they will face significant challenges. Unemployment is already on the increase. Three years ago, or sorry, about five years ago, the World Bank issued an, a number of about 100 million um, job opportunities should be created in the Middle East to absorb unemployment by 2020. Now, surely we would, we would not expect uh, such job opportunities will be offered by the public sector. There is no government who will be able to offer that level of but collectively from like North Africa and the Middle East. And those figures were like an estimate before the, uh, the Arab Spring. Now we are facing a different reality. Now, the, the, the big issue that will face the current administrations, whether that be like in Iraq or other countries, is that we have now a war against radicalism. And unemployment means having all those young people that they don't find like the right opportunity kind of like to, to have them on board, they will end up enlisting to joining the various armed groups and fuel sectarianism in the Middle East. And this is the danger that if uh, economic development does not take a serious um, uh, I mean, if, if governments don't take serious measures to develop uh, uh, economies um, in these reasons. Even like, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia, they suffer about at least 6% 6, 6 of unemployment. And they need to find about at least uh, 3 million job opportunities by 2020. Now, we are talking about supposedly a very rich country. and. And over the past two years, they've started to experience major deficit because of their involvement in, in various uh, issues in, in, in the Middle East, including the, the military campaigns in Yemen and, and, uh, and uh, other efforts in, in across the region, such as Syria. So the IMF, for example, in the, have already uh, mentioned and their reports that if Saudi Arabia continues to burn through their 
but in currency reserves. By 2020, they will uh, they will end up without any fiscal buffer to enjoy. So, over the past 12 months, we've seen them uh, um, losing, uh, uh, basically losing at least 110, 120 billion US dollars from the foreign currencies and declined from 730 billion down to uh, uh, 620. So. Uh, when we look into the capital, even like on their spending on, on defense, it's, it's, it's building up by the day. I think uh, last year they spent around 60 billion US dollars just on defense spending. So the issue here, when we talk about the increase of spending, the reliance on oil revenues, the increase of deficits, the increase of unemployment, is no more uh, just like Iraq, but also very, it's hitting various countries. And the increase of unemployment will uh, eventually um, um, uh, jeopardize uh, um, the security, the national security of these countries. So back to Iraq, we have um, the possibility of, of uh, basically, or the opportunity, should I say, the, to explore the, the various uh, options to diversify it. Starting with tourism, Iraq receives millions of visitors every year for, for, religious, for tourism. This should be well regulated and should be used properly to generate a viable economy. And we're talking about religious tourism around the year. Uh, let it be a blessing or a curse, but we have. Uh, about 150 days at least of public holiday, uh, and mostly because of the religious uh, events. So in a way, I would see it that if, we, if the government would use it uh, properly, it could generate a lot of money out of this, because we receive like millions of visitors and um, from all over the world. The second, it's about time to really go back to the initial rules that um, the times of the monarchy that used when it comes to handling government spending. When, during the 50s, uh, last century, that the Iraqi government uh, always kept um, government spending of any revenues to no more than 30%, allocating 70% to reconstruction and development. This formula should uh, replace the existing 70% or more on spending and 30% on investment, which of which 30% is kind of like a, a paid percentage because it's always uh, substituted for the for the pay for the deficit. So so basically, spending was very much 100%. Uh, the the power sector could be um, uh, could be uh, offered for investment. Uh, so instead of having like the Ministry of Electricity um, basically allocated billions of dollars of, uh, budgeting to import fuels or running power generation and so on, the government should really act as a regulator and invite independent power producers and investors to invest on the power generation. Um, aggressive plans in terms of like using, utilizing basically uh, the unnecessary uh, wastage in, 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 in the power sector. For example, Iraq, uh, the Iraqi gas constitutes 82 percent. Uh, sorry, 82 percent of the Iraqi gas is, is, is in form of associated gas. It comes with the oil. So, um, the more oil we pump, the more gas comes with it. But this requires technologies and development. Unfortunately, because of the lack of technologies that we have, um, Iraq flares most of its gas, and now Iraq is flares around. Iraq, Iraq flaring, uh, gas flaring uh, has reached 1.5, 1.6 billion cubic feet. To quantify that, it means fueling electricity to four million households. Uh, so, any kind of like fuel imports that we would kind of budget to uh, provide electricity to, to those houses. We can free the, the liquid for export to generate more cash. 
and and uh, utilize the cloud gas uh, um, and uh, and uh, use it for electricity. So uh, of course there are other measures such as, for example, having the decoupling the operatorship from the uh, um, from the company's regulator bodies. Um, over the past, just before the over the past uh, um, fifty years, Iraq as uh, Iraqi government uh, um, ministries have all acted as kind of like operators, um, where you have like the regulator and the regulated body uh, merged in one entity. So that uh, so during, for example, even during Saddam time during the eighties. He dissolved the Iraq National Oil Company, and it became kind of like subsidiaries of um, departments to the Ministry of Oil. Okay, it may work well if we have kind of a, a dictatorship regime that controls everything and corruption centralized in one hand. But when you have uh, a democratic system, it doesn't work at all because. Uh, that decoupling is a, is a must to have uh, to, to resolve the issue of conflict of interest. Also, it's unconstitutional because you, we need basically all the state-owned enterprises uh, to compete equally uh, uh, with those of private sectors on uh, business opportunities. And this will eventually help the private sector will basically to, to, uh, to survive and, and to uh, welcome uh, more uh, employment, shifting the, the, the and basically the public sector to the private sector. So uh, there are measures that could be uh, considered, some on short term, some mid term and long term, but it's possible and that kind of like image uh, of like Iraq's will collapse, I, I don't agree with it. Yes, Iraq is facing difficult time, and it may face much more difficult times than what it's facing today. But it, it will geographically, socially, politically, it will exist. It survived the past hundred years, and it will survive uh, the, the future uh, challenges. Uh, and Iraq, uh, whether in terms of like uh, when it comes to security challenge. Uh, economic challenge, political challenge is not alone in this crisis. I can assure you every single country in the Middle East is facing the same challenge. So with this I would like to end uh, my talk and uh, uh, please if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. start, if I may, uh, among we both know well, uh, Father Chenery, who is uh, also one of the world's experts on oil, recommended before 2003 that uh, Iraq uh, privatize its oil industry with the oil in the ground um, to pass the risk of emerging technologies on to the international oil companies rather than for the government and the people of Iraq to bear the risk. Uh, if his advice had been followed in 2003 and thereafter, would we be talking about a different picture? Was it sound advice? Is it sound advice now? Is it doable now? Uh, well, that's a good question. Father Chelebi, by the way, Father Chelebi was also the um, um, Secretary General of Water uh, during the 80s. And um, he's the founder of the economic units of OPEC during the 60s. The, um, he always kind of like uh, his views very much into uh, supporting um, um, when it comes to Iraq, it protects its market share. And it's, uh, regardless of uh, supply and demand, because the cost of production and cost of development in Iraq is very much is the cheapest around the world. Um, uh, he always advised that Iraq should uh, develop the maximum capacity when it comes to uh, uh, production capacity, and as well as per capacity, to defend its, uh, its market share. Um, during the, for example, during the years of Saddam Hussein, 23 years, according to one of his studies, Iraq lost uh, the opportunity of marketing at least 
uh, half a billion uh, barrel. Um, and, um, uh, sorry, 16 billion barrel, uh, of which um, uh, it could have uh, fetched around uh, 500 uh, billion dollars uh, over the course of a quarter of a century. Uh, this is something that, uh, and of course he uh, advised on to the integrated, adopting of the concept of integrated projects, of which linking upstream or downstream, uh, which is the refineries with the ec and, and as well as the exploration and production. Uh, the easy way for the previous administration <coughs> is not to think strategically, it's just to follow the oil prices and produce oil and not to think of uh, setting up sophisticated uh, fiscal uh, terms uh, that help uh, basically integrate, uh, integrate these projects and help the infrastructure build in parallel to the oil production capacity. Uh, at the moment, and also not to think of developing um, some petroleum regimes that would, uh, would help in, in basically developing um, um, the cost recovery plans in a way not to affect governments during an era of global crisis. So there is a, 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 an aspect or level of, of, of risk share. And this, uh, these issues were not uh, followed. And as I said, uh, the administrations post-2003 were incompetent. Uh, Every single one, I would say, is incompetent, and uh, and unfortunately, the uh, the international community, specifically the United States, uh, did not, I mean, as a kind of like a key player in the regime change, should have at least advised or uh, played a, a an influential role in telling the administrators in Iraq, listen, relying on high oil price and uh, inflating your budget is not the way forward. Uh, because you, are, you will be hitting a, a scenario of which there is no income or very little income and you don't have infrastructure. And this is what we're facing. So, yes, his advice were good and, and, and so as many others tried try to contribute, but unfortunately nobody listened because they thought they know it. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, what is uh, the origin and the roots of these problems you mentioned? Uh, for example, uh, this problem uh, is the uh, performance of government is very big, or uh, you haven't created a standard system in the country, or uh, uh, in interior, uh, interior of uh, other countries in your country, or diversity in cultural and religion in your country. What is the origin of these problems you mentioned? The, the, the uh, incompetence. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, this happens kind of like a gradual buildup immediately after the fall of the monarchy. Uh, it, the last eight years of the monarchy, were, um, I, in my opinion, I think uh, they were the, the very much successful years, uh, especially when King Faisal II um, assumed power and he started to build an inclusive administration and bring the most competent um, um, cabinet ministers uh, to help them um, setting the Council of Reconstruction. The, uh, the problem that um, Iraq had to uh, face is after the fall of the monarchy because interferences of the um, uh, um, Arab movements and, and Egypt and so on, of which encouraged all the uh, the nationalists and so on to to basically wage the revolt for the sake of the revolt, not just for the sake because it was things were moving like on the right direction during towards the end of the, the, the 50s. It was a completely an external 
uh, interference and, 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 and Professor Estrabati's speciality could uh, talk for hours and hours on this. <coughs> um, after uh, the first um, republic, um, the whole, uh, the, 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 new, the subsequent administrations until the arrival of the Ba'ath Party, um, the, the, Gabbard, the, the Iraqi people became very much under a military rule. So it was like the military kind of like took control and uh, started to gradually drift from uh, diversity of, of revenues and diversity of an economic, viable economic portfolio into relying on um, oil revenues. Because at that time, the nationalization took place um, uh, uh, of, of oil uh, from the 60s and uh, concluded uh, in the uh, early 70s, even though that it was the monarchy that took the first steps to, uh, to uh, claim its rights in terms of like, the oil revenue by dealing with the, what it used to be called the Seven Sisters, which is the main oil companies that controlled the oil assets uh, in Iraq, of the Iraq Petroleum Company. Uh, and to agreeing 50-50 agreement in which 50% of the revenues goes to the Iraqi government and, 50, and they hold 50%. But at that time, the Iraqi government, said, under the monarchy, they set up this 30-70% split of uh, spending and, and had, had uh, the, the Iraqi governments or the, even like the post-monarchy followed that system, they could have survived uh, the dilemma. But uh, again, they followed uh, oil prices followed more on relying on oil revenues and um, um, gradually relying on military rules until they arrived at the coup of the Ba'ath Party in 1968 and then the absolute uh, totalitarian regime of Saddam in 1970. Sorry, just... I am just uh, curious as to um from my understanding, uh, Iraq's largest oil customer is the People's Republic of China. I'm just curious as to how Chinese national oil corporations are engaging Iraq, and maybe more importantly, how is the Iraqi government dealing with uh, big oil from China? Are they, I mean, is there a coordinated strategy? Do, are, are they able to um, play one Chinese national corpor oil corporation off the other? Or is, I guess, what form of coordination do you see both on the Iraqi side and on Beijing's side in this uh, emerging? The, uh, yeah, the, the Chinese are the you're absolutely right. The Chinese are the uh, most influential player when it comes to oil development in Iraq, and they played it in a way to avoid blacklisting from the Iraqi government by having Sinopec operating in the north and CNPC and CNNC basically operating in the south. So when the Iraqi government uh, went to the Chinese government and says, what are you doing? Uh, we, we don't recognize the oil development as legitimate in, in the North without the consent of the federal government. Uh, and we tend to, we're going to blacklist these companies and say, yeah, blacklist the company, but you cannot blacklist the government. So, and because the Chinese are like the very much the only risk takers in, in terms of like the, the economic development, so the Iraqi government had no option but to uh, basically deal with them and, and uh, yes, they blacklisted Sinopec at the time uh, and um, award uh, <coughs> joint producing assets in the south to CNPC, but it's part of like as with BP and other authorities. Now, the problem here we have is the, is the modality of these fiscal regimes. When Iraq launched the uh, first and second licensing round, oil, it should have uh, structured it in a way uh, to number one, assume volatility in oil prices, so uh, not kind of like oil prices will go up forever or just stay high. Number two, to uh, develop uh, the, the system in a way uh, where we have the, uh, um, the infrastructure and the downstream and midstream, uh, uh, basically, uh, infrastructure to be in, uh, built in, in, in parallel, um, 
treated basically when developing the upstream. So we have like refineries in place, pipelines, and, and uh, all the all the facilities that uh, should be in place. The the other thing is that the the partnership. Um, Iraqi, the Iraqi government made a big mistake by blacklisting and, and, and uh, blacklisting companies that those who operated in the north. This is a political problem between Baghdad and Erbil, between Kurdistan and the federal government. It should have not impacted the, the involvement of oil companies. Just imagine if those small and mid-sized companies, uh, if they had the uh, um, chance to participate in the first and second licensing round, they could have changed the dynamics of the partnership. Number one, those are those companies are uh, fast movers. Uh, they are um, they are faster also in developing uh, uh, projects. Uh, they could have helped a lot in reducing the level of costs. Uh, when you have just the majors playing, so you would expect high costs will continue to be the case, and uh, slow in, in performance and deliverables. So all these kind of, is, there was an error in the strategy. So in terms of like, hey, we, the Iraqi government succeeded in, 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 in flogging and, and selling, and, and basically winning um, companies to, uh, to play part in, in super giant field. This is, this is, in my humble opinion, is not a major achievement. There are count a handful number of super giant fields in the world, six of them in Iraq, and uh, and they all kind of like uh, they they have like zero risk when it comes to the geology and the development and so on. And even if oil prices go down to ten dollars, they are still profitable, unlike other assets. So so. The, 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 the clever part should be like on how to, how to develop a strategy by 2020, I have enough refining capacity not only meeting lo my local demand, but export. Like for example, the United States uh, used the era of high oil prices in a clever way by developing unconventional, added to their production capacity at least 5.3 million, million barrels. And, and basically products, even like oil products, exports increased between 2010 and 2015 from 1 million to 4 million. Okay, they are part of like swap assets and so on, but, but in fact it, it, it uses the opportunity to develop its uh, unconventional capacity. Many thought that, oh, if oil prices go down to the that's during the height, that, Hundred dollar barrel. They said if oil prices go down to sixty dollars a barrel, uh, the unconventionals and, and, and the shell oil will shut down. They don't understand the economics that it, it continued to survive even when oil prices went down to twenty eight dollars, <laughs> because the investment was already committed. Technologies helped in mitigating the, the various issues, reducing the cost, and yes, uh, shale oil will be affected if uh, oil prices uh, continue to go down. But so as other assets across the world, so that's why we could see like an era of like a stability of like oil prices could be anything between 28 to 38, and this is uh, okay to, to kind of like sustain current production levels and. and State. Uh, this is, these are the, these are the kind of like the issues that the various um, 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 that, that the, the government should have taken into consideration. Also, the international oil companies, whether national oil companies such as the CNPC, uh, Simon, they should have and Shell and BP should have also taken into consideration that it's not about signing a deal and distributing bonuses between executive. And this is unfortunately what happened, because it, I mean, who, who formulate these kind of like strategies? Uh, the same bureaucrats within those IOCs, the international companies, uh, have um, uh, have developed these strategies. So, with the the early years of cost recovery in Iraq, Iraq is, is 
need, needs to allocate a good 10 to 12 billion US dollars per annum. Okay, that's uh, just to pay international companies for cost recoveries and remuneration. This sounds okay when you, when you earn 100 billion or 120 billion. You're talking about 10%. But after discount rates and decline of oil prices, and you earn about, hardly you earn 30 billion, 30 billion per annum, we're talking about 40% of your budget just to pay international oil companies, which is a, a suicide. Uh, and this is something that the international oil companies should have taken into consideration to tell the host government by the way, have you ever considered things will be? We have to, uh, we have to agree some sort of a, 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 a balanced uh, um, uh, formula of which it could sustain our operation uh, regardless of, of the volatility of oil prices. Uh, I am puzzled when I uh, <coughs> when I read uh, either what is being written about the effect of the, uh, of the price collapse on Iraq as well as the GCC countries, how little attention is given to the, uh, to the need of development in uh, all uh, different, the basic frameworks, whether policy, market, or institutional. And almost everything I read sort of focuses on price reform on, uh, on certain aspects, but very little of them sort of address the need for regulatory reform, uh, you know, the issues that uh, fiscal efficiency, uh, commitment, uh, you know, and so forth. And I think everything that you have mentioned here, I sort of agree with you completely, but I see that the challenge is in the development of the frameworks themselves. I mean, things can probably still continue to develop positively with weak uh, frameworks, but the frameworks really pose very, very significant challenge in the GCC countries as well as a major. Of course, in Iraq, you have the other additional issues. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're right. When it comes to um, institutional reform and, and policy framework, all these uh, matters are key when it comes to the economic development and the stability of, of, uh, uh, of the, basically of the economy of any given country. Um, we mentioned earlier that the transition of, of, from centralism to federalism in Iraq, it was a kind of like a major shock that to the Iraqi people uh, although they kind of like went and, uh, and, and voted for that referendum and participated to, to just kind of, we know that this kind of political, uh, uh, people just wanted to get away with, um, to pass these things. But for example, in Iraq, although we are constitutionally federal on paper, but in practice we are still central immediately after the, after the referendum of the, of the Constitution, we should have the key institutions, federal institutions in place that shapes up uh, the, the, the Iraqi economy. Uh, for example, the upper house, the uh, federal oil and gas council uh, um, that act as a regulator of the industry, the federal distribution um, um, commission that uh, basically according to the Constitution, should distribute to the revenues to all Iraqis or based on the spending per provinces, etc. Uh, the federal constitution, a federal <coughs> constitutional court, not the court that was set up by Bremen, but something as per Article 92 of the Iraqi Constitution. So all these institutions uh, should have been in place. We have the relevant articles that underpins these institutions that are still await, awaiting uh, a law to pass. Uh, but because of like uh, consensus uh, formula that overruled the right of democracy in terms of like voting laws and moving forward, uh, all these things hindered the progress of institutional reform from centralism to, to federalism. 
Um, the, uh, the big issue uh, here we have is we have the, the petty politics uh, between the various parties not taking into consideration the, the bigger challenges that could face them, the unknowns that could, say, that could face them, and it could uh, change everything. Nobody uh, a few years ago have ever thought of like uh, Daesh or ISIS or things or like it, or oil prices will go dramatically down to the uh, days of 2004 or 5 and suddenly these things are facing everyone uh, so um, so yes um, 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 setting a, a framework whether at the policy level as well as like a developing institution uh, together with the frameworks to help contributing to the state building uh, something key now on the oil crisis was back in 2009, I think, 2000 and, so 2010, when uh, uh, Naimi, Minister Naimi of Saudi Arabia, he talked about fair oil price. And it's kind of like a trend in like an OPEC. Some important minister mentions something, everyone uh, fashionably follow on, they say, oh, fair oil price, and whatever. So he said, like, the fair oil price of $75, as if, like, setting the price. And I, I remember that I received uh, a few phone calls from CNN and Bloomberg and Financial Times asking, well, I have views about what is the fair oil. I said, what fair oil? I said, it's a supply and demand. There is no such thing in fair oil. There's a supply and demand. And then after two years, when oil prices started to increase and they came like uh, 90, 95, and he, Naomi said, no, the oil price now is not 75, it's 95 first, and now 95 dollars a barrel. So every single minister, the, like you hold an OPEC, introduced, oh, the fair oil price is 95 dollars. So like the parrots repeating, echoing each other. There is no such thing called fair oil price. There is supply and demand and cost of oil, the cost of production. If the, if, the, if, the, if the cost of production affects major production centers and start to cut kind of like supply and we have like major oil fields offline, then we could see kind of like demand increasing again and, 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 uh, uh, and correct the prices basically because, because it, these dips and, and, and increases kind of like it uh, are not uh, uh, kind of not contributed to the fundamental of markets. It was, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ahmed Zaki Amani when he said, like, the political uh, influences and impacts, it could have short impacts on, on oil prices, but the, when it comes to uh, long term, it's a question of economics, of supply and demand. And yes, uh, our demand on oil will increase when uh, the economic uh, situation improves. But we have, uh, for example, um, China relies on major imports from, to, to take place from, from Europe. Europe is still not recovering from the 2008 credit crunch. Uh, so one continent connects to the other. And uh, when we talk about like uh, weak economic recovery, there are a number of factors playing into that. Having said that, when you look into the energy mix and the contributor to the energy mix, we should take a, a long view of uh, how things will play. We've seen now the major consumer, for example, of oil, is transportation. And plenty of transportation industries are moving to hybrid. So things will change. But you agree that it is the, uh, the frameworks is the major challenge. And would the GCC and the RAC be able to bring that Yeah, I mean, I mean if, we, if, 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 if we want to talk about institutional framework, this is something that really needs to be addressed seriously. I think the, um, the various, the, the Middle East producers should really uh, consider reforming their economies in a way that to start with, 
we're facing our subsidies is costing them a lot. Uh, in Iraq, subsidies costing uh, around uh, 15 billion US dollars. In Saudi Arabia, subsidies could be uh, any, anything between uh, 85 billion dollars or above. But even that uh, was not addressed in the last sub the subsidies reform. All uh, across the Gulf. Yeah, well, well, the thing is that if we want to start to impose taxes, um, uh, taking off all these luxuries, and uh, really having uh, a viable uh, system uh, such as those in the West, we have to take into consideration the political reform. Uh, because when it comes to taxation, you really need to consider representation. Uh, I mean, the only kind of like uh, offering that these countries in the Middle East that GCC in specific would offer is a tax-free uh, safe haven environment and so on. You take that out of the way and you'll see businesses moving out. Because I'm not sure, I'm not sure that uh, uh, foreigners are going to the Gulf because of the lovely beaches or the democracy and uh, employed there. One more question. Time for one more. No, no, please, wherever you want. Just uh, first, let me greet you with this Islamic greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, as far as I have said uh, regarding the Iraq, Iraq uh, was uh, several centuries of rich history, which you mentioned in your speech about Babylon, and it was, uh, in that time it was called as Bain by, by Nahrain. But uh, in the recent decades, the situation has somehow changed. Uh, in Middle East countries like Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, these countries are uh, currently struggling and trying to remove the terrorism. Uh, and also, for example, in, uh, in Iraq and Syria, they are struggling with ISIS. In uh, Africa, Al Shabaab. In Afghanistan and Pakistan, they are trying to remove Taliban and Lashkar Taliban. All oh, different types of groups. Why don't these countries? to not unite and get together to remove all this terrorism. What causes these countries that they do Education, not unite? lack of education. And also um, 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 unwise spending on education. Saudi Arabia spends 25% of its budget on education. Yet we have the most undiplomatic representation of 3,000 Saudi suicide bombers in Iraq. Uh, it's all about education. You have, when you have billions of dollars spent on, on, I'm not saying, I'm not accusing like, the government, whatever, I'm saying the mismanagement of that spending. I mean, and we are not talking about, uh, we're talking about a rich country that happened to enjoy good income. Uh, its budget something like uh, over a quarter of a trillion US dollars and their pop population is about around 30 million. In fact, one third of that population are expats, so they only take care of two thirds. And even those two thirds, they suffer about a minimum of six six percent of unemployment. So there is a big question, and there's a lot of. I mean, I remember when I when I did my first degree back in the UK in the, in the early nineties, I used to see missions of uh, students coming. to well, my first university, Kingston University in, in Surrey, London. Um, coming from paid or full scholarship from Saudi Arabia. And their job, at least in my year, there's about 50 students arrived, fully paid by the Saudi government, and their job is not to attend lectures, is to address every single non-Muslims and even their fellow Muslims as infidels. And this is back 25 years ago. So, so the answer to your question is, 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 is lack of education one thing, and fueling money in the wrong place, and mismanaging that education money allocation, and, and to, you will know, have ignorance. Professor El Toma would like to comment, so I can't say no, Professor El Toma. He was my mother's professor. So, uh, I have to let him comment. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. I would like to repair to your optimistic conclusion about Iraq's future. Having read yesterday Ayad's Alawi's confession published in a Shahbal outside, indicating how 
that the mystic is about the current situation and the direction of the country. 